I usually speak uh, off the cuff. Alex doesn't trust me, so he wrote notes. So if I seem odd, it's um, doing just a little bit differently than usual. Anyways, uh, we are the Preservation Society. Uh, most of you know us as a nonprofit group here in the uh, city of Fall River. And we've been working on this preservation project on the Dr. Isaac Fisk House, built in 1833 in its notable uh, resident, uh, Dr. Fisk, who was uh, uh, appreciated as an abolitionist during the time. And uh, the big deal here is that last year, we reached out to Roger Williams, and uh, they accepted to work with us as part of uh, their community preservation uh, partnership. Is this center or project? It's Community Partnership Center, CPC. <laughs> That's why Alex writes notes for me. It says it, it says it right there. See that? That's <laughs> <laughs> teamwork right there. <laughs> uh, and uh, so the project is being led by uh, Associate Professor Dr. Charlotte Carrington Farmer. That's me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I know I have a very long name, so I'm yes. so sorry about that. And, and if I get it wrong, I've got to hear it from Alex. So, and uh, uh, with the uh, footwork, the grunt work done by T.J. Ward Hi. and Kristen Black. Uh, um, I think I saw a bunch of different things on you, Doc, but uh, probably the most notable people I'm paying attention to is the Medallion uh, Project in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and uh, the Medallion project is uh, about doing research on the Underground Railroad activity in Rhode Island. So this was kind of a nice segue to help us out in the Fall River. Where are we here? Hey, that's the house. Um, the house is one of about six or seven that we believe are in Fall River that are documented or known to some degree or another. Uh, the Holy Grail for Underground Railroad designation is the uh, Network to Freedom, uh, which has been elusive for us, but we're close, we're close. And with their help, we've gotten more information on what actually happened at this house and with Dr. Isaac Fisk. Uh, a lot of... Uh, slaves were thought to have come from Maryland by ship up to New Bedford. Uh, interestingly, as we were doing some of the research, it looked like some of them actually came up on the far of a line. Uh, we actually had done research to a rumor about Henry Box Brown, who was delivered in a box, he delivered himself in a box to, I think it was to Philadelphia, or Pennsylvania, and then the story was that he may have come to our site here. The box wasn't delivered to Fall River though. What happened was that he left Philadelphia, he went to New York City, and he quickly came up to Boston. Uh, and uh, we were actually trying to figure out how he might have pulled off that trip. And I think that because he was in New York City, the more likely uh, route would have been the uh, Fall River line. Uh, the, the, train, the train from New York City wasn't in that type of shape uh, before 1850, but the fall of a line was, uh, which might have explained how uh, Henry Box Brown got to Boston so quickly uh, through that whole trip. That was a segue, sorry about that, Alex. <laughs> uh, we bought the property in 2018. Uh, the fall of his local community preservation act a committee uh, helped fund it. And uh, all of a sudden, boy, will chuckle about the little bit of work we've been doing along the way. Uh, and we're really dedicated to actually preserving the building. And someday, get an actual exhibit space done in this basement, where Dr. Fess actually helped, had his homeopathic uh, office. And if you've driven by the property, you know that on the side here, there's a cute door and vestibule where his entrance would have been. Uh, the office was lost because they used it for 
uh, residential apartment space for the past 100 years. Um, but the gross space itself is, is still there, and we've got a vision to uh, try to replicate what it may have looked like at some point. Yeah, thank you, Alex. I didn't mention we actually also had a little small grant from Bristol County Savings Bank and Bay Coast Bank. Uh, the work we've done, you can see, repairing the windows. Uh, all, almost every single window is original, except a couple that have been replaced before we bought it. There's some pool scraping lead. Um, um, you see the shutters on the front, working shutters in historically uh, appropriate storm windows, trying to make the place look right. Not just to save the building, but also because it reflects the neighborhood, and we're trying to make the neighborhood stepped up too. It's a tough neighborhood, and we're doing our part to, to make a difference there too. Not to mention the actual property management that goes into a building like this. So I want to uh, give credit to my board for doing this. We actually have uh, seven tenants living in the building, the management of the, of the tenants and the properties, it's a big deal. So thank you, my boy. Another segue. <laughs> uh, but back to what we did with Roger Williams. Kristen and TJ, like I said, really did the footwork for this. Um, and we, we really appreciate that. Uh, and maybe another quick segue. The starting start off of this research that, that put us on track to the doctor discuss was actually from Ken Champlin. So uh, uh, those of you know, from Fall River know Ken Champlin. Um, he really did a lot of work before to get us to this stage. He's not here tonight, but I'll always appreciate what he did for us. He's still breathing though, right? He is still breathing. Yeah. Uh, this is what we have downstairs in the basement of the Dr. Fisk House right now, um, a recent uh, donation uh, representing the property with uh, some symbolism in the painting itself. I won't do it all, but if you take a peek at it, there's pieces of it, each little piece has a different meaning. Um, the Fisk House, like I said, is one of several in the city. None of the, none of the underground sites in Fall River have the Network for Freedom uh, designation, we're really hoping to be number one. Uh, <laughs> even if we're not, I think we've got the most documentation and uh, we, we do believe that it, it was a site. Uh, recently, I, I call it out of the blue, we were contacted by a distant relative of Dr. Fisk who lives in Saskatchewan in Canada. And it was that chance to let you, the community, know what they've come up with tonight. And uh, it's yours. Thank you. <laughs> you gonna trust her with it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Maybe you'll close us out, Alex. <laughs> All right, well, um, it's my real pleasure to be here with you this evening. As you heard, um, I'm Charlotte Carrington Farmer. Um, I'm an associate professor of history at Roger Williams University. Uh, and I'm so excited to talk to you probably for maybe five to 10 minutes. And then I'm gonna hand over to Kristen and TJ who did all of the work like let me not make any you know bones about it they did all of this research i just quietly stood back and, and watched them get on with it so um, i'm excited to learn along with you this evening um, about what that work looked like so before we start to think a little bit about um, isaac fisk and indeed um, the particular house he lived in in fall river um, I want to spend a little bit of time talking to you about how Fall River's role as an abolitionist hub fits within this larger narrative of freedom and slavery in the North and also in the South. And I think events like tonight, you know, where we celebrate the role of the North being a beacon of freedom in direct opposition to, you know, the oppressive South where slavery rules, sometimes obscures the actual pivotal role that New England played in the larger business of slavery. 
So before we move on to celebrate Fisk and abolitionism here in the North, I actually want to spend five to 10 minutes talking to you about some of the more problematic ways that New England was actually involved with slavery. So enslaved peoples lived and labored in Massachusetts Bay right from the birth of the colony until slavery was ab abolished. And even then, not everyone got their freedom immediately. New Englanders did not invent slavery, absolutely not. But when they built settlements here in the 17th century, they certainly embraced it. New Englanders were involved in slavery and the trade in enslaved peoples, both directly and indirectly, throughout the whole of the 17th century, the 18th century, and into the 19th century. From the get-go, um, this enslavement ideology was part of Massachusetts Bay, which tends to be depicted simply as a Puritan colony, and it wasn't, it was much more complicated. And New Englanders enslaved Africans, African Americans, and also indigenous peoples. So just seven years after Massachusetts Bay was founded, the settler colonists here enslaved vast numbers of Pequot peoples in 1637 particularly women and children. They sold many of them into slavery in the Caribbean, but some of the captives actually remained here in New England. <coughs> and a particular example that's relevant to, to us from Roger Williams University is Roger Williams himself had an unfree child who he enslaved after the Pequot War, split up from his mother and his siblings and renamed him, completely erasing his identity. So it's important that we as a university <coughs> tell these stories too. The following year then, in 1638, so just eight years after the arrival of the Arbella here into Boston, enslaved Africans directly arrived into the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and Governor John Winthrop recorded, quote, from his journal, <coughs> how some cotton and tobacco and, quote, Negroes had arrived from the West Indies. So in that same year, Samuel Maverick, who lived just outside of Boston, wanted to proactively increase the number of enslaved Africans, and I thought I could put quotes on that, uh, was for the first quote, desirous to have a breed of Negroes. He had two enslaved women and one enslaved man, and he encouraged one of the enslaved women and the enslaved man to have sex. And I'm giving you a trigger warning, as I would say to my students, I'm gonna talk about difficult content now. The enslaved woman refused, and I quote again, would not yield by persuasions. What kind of persuasions did her enslaver, Maverick, try to make the, the enslaved man do? Or what, what, try, what types of things was the enslaved man encouraged to do? Maverick refused to let his breeding plan simply fail because the woman objected. And he ordered the enslaved man to try to impregnate her by raping her. During the attack, the enslaved woman objected, and I quote again, very loud and shrill to the cause of her grief. Put simply, the cause of her grief was that her enslaver wanted her raped so he could use her body to increase the number of enslaved Africans here in Massachusetts Bay, eight years after the colony was founded. So if you want to learn more about this particular story, check out this book. I recommend it to everyone I meet who wants to learn more about slavery here in New England. Um, it's by Wendy Warren and it's called New England Man, Slavery and Colonization in Early America. So the number of enslaved Africans in New England increased as the 17th century progressed. And by the 1640s, the indigenous Narragansett peoples had their own word for a coal black man, which you can see here. Again, showing how their language had evolved to incorporate so many Africans who were coming into the colony. Uh, and this image that you see on the screen is from Roger Williams, a key into the language of America, which gives us those Narragansett words translated into the English language on the other side. <laughs> um, so New England's involvement in enslaving indigenous people skyrocketed as the 17th century progressed, particularly in the wake of King Philip's War when indigenous people were sold into slavery in the West Indies and many other places. The volume was so staggering, and so many Native Americans from around New England were shipped to places such as Barbados, and so many were sent specifically to the island of Barbados 
that the island of Barbados had to create its own specific law to limit the number of enslaved native peoples coming from New England to Barbados. That's how many they were sending from here. Uh, and what you can see on the screen is archival document from a Rhode Island <coughs> historical society that documents Roger Williams' role here and here in enslaving those native peoples. And as a side note, um, they actually used his son, Provid who's confusingly called Providence. You've got the town Providence and the son named Providence. They actually used his sloop to ship them down there to make extra profit. So, you know, as we think about enslaved peoples and the trade in enslaved peoples in the 18th century, this connection between New England and the West Indies prolifer proliferated. By the 1740s, as you see on the screen, New Englanders reported to the Board of Trade, quote, the West Indies have likewise reaped great advantage from our trade by being supplied with lumber of all sorts suitable for building houses, sugar works, making casts, beef, port, flour, and other provisions were daily carried to them with horses to turn their mills and vessels for their own use. And our African trade, our New England trade with Africa, carrying them, um, sorry, our, New our African trade often furnishes them with slaves for their plantations. So as that 18th century progressed, New England's role in that trade proliferates too. So one well-known family from Rhode Island, the DeWolfs, um, dominated a lot of this trade and over the course of 50 years and three generations the DeWolfs were in fact the nation's leading traders in enslaved people. Uh, they bought approximately 10,000 and some estimates say it's actually significant more, significantly more than that um, enslaved Africans from the west coast of Africa to auction blocks all around the Atlantic world in places such as Charleston, South Carolina, other southern US ports, Havana in Cuba and other ports, particularly in the Caribbean, and also to their own plantations in Cuba, and some of them eventually arrived here in New England too. The family continued in the trade despite federal and state laws prohibiting many of the activities in the late 18th century. Hi there. Um, so what you can see on the screen is actually um, what, what was mentioned in the introduction. So um, this, it, these are images for some, from some of the work that we've done with the Rhode Island Slave History Medallion Project. <coughs> and that project basically documents sites where enslaved peoples lived and labored around the state of Rhode Island. And this is something that Kristen and I have been involved in for a couple of years. You can see the installation ceremony here. Uh, and here at Linda Place in Bristol, which was one of the DeWolf mansions I was just talking about. Um, and actually, I'm going to um, an institute at Yale University this summer with our community partner, Charles Roberts, who heads up the Slave Medallion Project, to think about how we can expand Rhode Island's model of slave medallions in other places, such as Connecticut and also Massachusetts. So it's committed not to necessarily talking about freedom and abolition, but to sites where enslaved peoples lived and labored. So New Englanders were not only involved in the trade in enslaved peoples, and throughout the 18th century, enslaved peoples lived and labored throughout New England in almost every imaginable scenario. So, you know, I stopped early at 1750, but we can see that the North as a whole has at least 30,000 enslaved peoples by 1750. And I know that trend continues. Um, so they worked in every imaginable scenario. Enslaved peoples worked on large agricultural plantations, making cheese, raising horses and livestock. They honed specialist trades such as um, stone masonry in bustling cities. They worked building ships, making stone walls. They served in grand houses. They contributed to every aspect of life here in the northern colonies and later in the northern states. And one of the myths that I want to lay to rest this evening is that enslavement in the north was somehow kinder and more benevolent. Therefore, enslaved people simply accepted it. Let me be clear, it was not and they did not. One early 18th century enslaver in New England, Reverend James McSparren described, quote, I got up early this morning and finding Hannibal, who was one of his enslaved peoples, had been out, I stripped and gave him a few lashes till he begged. As Harry was untying him, my poor wife saying I'd not given him enough, 
gave him a lash or two, upon which he ran. Um, and McSparrow's journal is a really rich source um, for historians on this particular matter. You can see the manuscript source down here. Um, later on in the journal, he describes how he placed Hannibal in pot hooks, essentially a metal collar designed to hamper movement because he was known as a freedom seeker. So, you know, before we get to the stories of people escaping north to, you know, places like Massachusetts for freedom, people were running away from their enslavers here in New England. So I really want to highlight that. Um, Another one of uh, Max Barron's enslaved peoples was an enslaved woman called Maroka. Um, she was whipped, and I'm giving you a language warning, warning here, for being out whoring, essentially from visiting her, um, her partner, um, who was a potential suitor who lived at another plantation. When she later had a baby, McSparren sold the child. So countless, I could talk to you all evening about this, but countless primary sources reveal how enslavement in and around New England was contested at every step. And freedom seekers ran away from their enslavers here. They lobbied for their freedom in the courts, and they also worked to live full lives within the constraints of their enslavement. Slavery persisted in New England into the 19th century, and even after individual states passed various acts, it often took years for the lived reality to actually change. And as the 19th century progressed, so too did New England's relationship with slavery, along with its physical landscape. Mills and industrialization proliferated, and you know I was reminded of that. That's particularly relevant to places such as Fall River. Uh, these were fueled by cotton from the South, and the fields, well, the cotton was picked by enslaved people. Moreover, many of the mills produced what they called, quote, Negro cloth, the coarse and uncomfortable cloth that enslaved peoples in the South and also in the Caribbean were forced to wear as they carried out backbreaking work, picking cotton, working on the sugar plantations, working on the tobacco plantations. And many primary sources describe how enslaved peoples felt like the cloth was sticking needles into their skin. So I start with all of this, right? So when we remember that how Fisk and other abolitionists here in New England, I think we also need to remember this difficult history too. It's all New England history. It's all American history. And it's painful, right? It's painful work to do. It's painful history to learn about. There's no way around this. And I don't think there should be. We do this work with the greatest respect for those who suffered almost unthinkable violence, terror, and death, and simultaneously acknowledge African, African-American, and indigenous survival and resilience. I think we have a responsibility, both individually and collectively as a community, to tell complete and truthful histories, to tell stories that connect communities, and also work eventually to heal generational trauma. So honoring the role that Isaac Fisk plays, as we're about to do, in helping end suffering and working with amazing public history organizations and preservation societies, such as the Fall River Preservation Society, I think it holds us accountable to our commitment to anti-racist work today. As Lorraine Spears, Narragansett, director of the Tomaquat Museum, I quote her, she says, we need the truthful dialogue in order for that to prevail the history of the land, you need to understand it. So she says, the history of the land you are, um, the process of settler colonialism, this will enable us to, quote, begin to unpack this history and heal from the historical trauma. And I think acknowledging these positive stories alongside these negative stories together is certainly a starting point. So collectively, these stories enable us to create what historian Marcus Rettiker has coined in the subtitle to his fabulous book that I also recommend, The Slave Ship, he describes it as a human history, right? If we simply focus on documents with lists and you know statistics such as ledgers, account books, tables, sometimes I think we hide the terror and torture of the human experience that freedom seekers who eventually pass Fall River would have certainly experienced. And a lot of the time, I think we have to be careful, particularly in the late 18th and early 19th century, to take some of the documents we read with a grain of salt. Indigenous people in particular are written out of the record and incorrectly classified in a form of what has been described as documentary genocide. 
Um, and one kind of final point from me before I hand over to Kristen and TJ, I think it's really important as we do this work to acknowledge that words matter, words have power. So as we share the history this evening, we'll strive to use words that are sympathetic, um, show empathy, I think, to those whose history has been marginalized. For example, you'll hear us use phrases like enslaved rather than slave. The noun imply, the noun slave implies that the person was at their core a slave. Instead, we'll use the adjective enslaved to show that bondage was not their core existence and they were enslaved by the actions of another person. Therefore, we use the term enslaver rather than owner or master, as it was those people exerted their power over the people they kept in bondage. And I think these words reinforce the idea of people's humanity rather than the conditions that were forced upon them. Terms such as fugitive, runaway, or escapee were simply constructs of a slaveholding society. Thus, we'll use the term freedom seekers, as this accurately represents a people that Fisk and other abolitionists sought to help. So it's now time for me to hand over to two wonderful Budden historians who completed all of this research on the Fisk property last semester. You know, this was really no easy task. The students mastered paleography skills to read manuscripts sourced. Sometimes, you know, for this project and others, reading that handwriting is hard, there's weird spellings. You know, sometimes um, the documents are missing, they're torn, they're damaged, and Fall River is really strange, right? You know, it switches between jurisdictions, you know, the name has an issue um, as well. So it's sometimes hard to keep track of this history. So I'm gonna hand over shortly to Kristen. So Kristen will speak first. So I'm gonna introduce both students now and then hand over. So Kristen Black is a senior at Roger Williams University. She is a history and preservation studies double major with a minor in art and architectural history. She's going to carry on with her master's in history at Providence College in the fall. <coughs> and in addition to this project, she's completed several research projects for the Rhode Island Slave History Medallions Project. Following Kristen will be TJ Ward, TJ is a sophomore at Roger Williams University and he's a future educator. I've had the pleasure of working with TJ in every class since he started as a freshman. Um, and TJ as a history education major with a secondary education major together, um, I think is gonna be a fabulous teacher or educator of some kind in the future. And TJ has played a pivotal role in the innovative pedagogies that we pioneer on campus, in particular, reacting to the past that I'm sure he can talk to you about later. He's also an active member of the Honours Programme at Roger Williams University. So Kristen, I hand over to you. Different meanings have been attached to the term Underground Railroad at different times and places. When we use the term tonight, it references escape from slavery through flight and or assistance in that escape. At its core, the Underground Railroad was a grassroots movement in which people united across racial, gender, religious, and class lines to bring about change. Most freedom seekers who passed through New England on the way to Canada crossed some section of Massachusetts. The regular Underground Railroad route from New Bedford to 1851 extends 13 miles northwest to Fall River. There were three routes northward from Fall River, one through Vermont by way of Valley Falls and Worcester, another up to Barrowsville, Norton, Massachusetts, to Attleboro. The third went up the Taunton River to Taunton and then to Barrowsville. From the 1830s, Fall River was an important center for freedom seekers. Conductors on the Underground Railroad would take in desperate freedom seekers, often starving and sometimes clad in tattered rags or even disguised in costumes. They would hide them from the law until their next stop was arranged and then send them northwards to Canada. The conductors and their cargo were criminals in the eyes of the law for breaking the fugitive slave law. White conductors such as Fisk risked seek fines and imprisonment. Freedom seekers risked being sent back to the hell of slavery and punishment including weapons, brandings, or mutilations. Because of the secrecy, we will never know exactly how many freedom seekers passed through Fall River or even how many stations there were. Dr. Isaac Fisk 
was a prominent anti-slavery advocate who published important articles in key local and national outlets, such as the Fall River Monitor and the Liberator. The Dr. Isaac Fisk House, located at 263 Pine Street in Fall River, was Fisk's residence. He lived there with his wife, Anna Robinson Fisk, his son, George Fisk, and his daughter, Anna Fisk, from 1845 until the surviving members of the Fisk family sold the property in 1875. Fisk was a Quaker who worked with other Quakers throughout New England to condemn slavery ethically and religiously. Prior to moving to Fall River, Fisk lived in Situate, Rhode Island, where he was an active member of the Anti-Slavery Society and advocated for immediate emancipation. While living in Situate, in 1836, Fisk opened a boarding school for boys and girls. While operating the boarding school, Fisk was listed in the 1840 census as having 13 people living in his home, including one free male of color who was between the age of 10 to 24. By 1844, Isaac Fisk had sold his boarding house and moved to Tiverton briefly before settling in Fall River. In Fall River, Fisk played a key role in the abolitionist movement. In January of 1849, the Liberator reported that Fisk was involved in key resolutions at an anti-slavery convention in Rhode Island. He and others declared that there is no other way in which the people of the free state can be saved from abject supremacy to the slave power and from a complete wreck of principle <coughs> and conscience, except in a dissolution of the union with slaveholders. Fisk and fellow abolitionists made it clear that there could be no union with slaveholders and they sought to summon every humane, honest, and God-fearing soul to come to, this, to the standard of truth and life, right. <clears throat> Throughout the 1850s, Fisk worked hard to bring real life change. In November of 1851, there was another anti-slavery convention in Fall River, where Fisk had important abolitionists stay with him. At the convention, impressive truth was spoken in plain and unequivocal terms on the most important religious and political bearings of the anti-slavery enterprise. Fall River abolitionists affirmed that there would be no union with slaveholders but the soundest reasoning and the purest morality. In 1854, Fisk was moved when, uh, when he heard fellow, fell, <clears throat> excuse me, fellow abolitionist Sally Hawley speak. Hawley educated African Americans and traveled around the country giving rousing speeches in favor of abolition. Fisk wrote to the Liberator about how <laughs> impactful it was and that anyone who could listen to her talk and not be moved were deaf to the poor and needy. He also wrote, and he, <clears throat> he also wrote that he hoped to talk, uh, to that this talk made more people aware of the truth, justice, and humanity. In 1859, Fisk played a central role in Fall River's efforts to raise money for John Brown's plight when he was accused of murder and treason against the trait of Virginia after inciting an insurrection amongst enslaved people. This was dedicated to ending, to ending the hunting of freedom, freedom hunters, and in 1861, he led Fall River's petition to end the practice in Massachusetts. Fisk's letter to William Lloyd Garrison from 1564 declared he was in heart and hand with thee in support of Lincoln, Lincoln as an abolitionist. A family book published in 1896 uh, uh, cemented the role that, that, Fisk pro uh, that Fisk property played in helping freedom seekers. Dr. Fisk's house was, an, was a rendezvous for the abolitionists or escaping slave. It also, was, it also reinforced Fisk's broader connections with abolitionism and how the Boston Liberator, Garrison's paper, came to him as long as it was published. Additionally, a letter from Fisk's daughter, Anna Harding, described how freedom seekers say, uh, stayed at the house during their escape to the north to Canada. Writing in 1923 to family members, descendants described how they knew when they came home from school that there might be an escaped slave at the house on his way to no on his way north to freedom in canada whose presence must be mentioned with uh, with bated breath she reaffirmed how the liberator william lloyd garrison's anti-slavery newspaper was often read and the wrong of the poor slave were never a ceasing sorrow and regret and subject for prayer the letter mentions how freedom seeker henry box brown who escaped from the south in a big packing box as freight stayed in the, in the fisk house Fisk did not advocate for freedom seekers in a vacuum. His sister, Mary Fisk, and her husband, Helen Clark, were also active abolitionists throughout Rhode Island, throughout the uh, Rhode Island Anti-Slavery Society. Fisk's nephew, Dr. Henry Bradford Clark, was also a well-known abolitionist in, Bed in New Bedford. Fisk was also plugged into 
of both the wider Quaker network and also underground railroad sites nearby. As a part of this project, we considered how New uh, Fall River connected to uh, other local hubs, notably, notably New Bedford, and attended a conference on sailing to freedom, maritime dimensions of the Underground Railroad at New Bedford Whaling Museum as part of a book launch with accompanying exhibit. Within Fall River, in addition, sorry, in addition to the Fisk House, there are also five other places that were state houses for freedom seekers, many of them close to where Fisk lived. These included Nathaniel Briggs boardings, uh, boarding zone, Abraham Bowen's home, uh, Albion King Slade and Mary Bridge Kennedy's home, William Barnaby, Mar Barnabas's, uh, Barnabas Kennedy's home, and the Andrew Robinson Jr. and Mary Arnold Allen House, later the William Hill Senior House. To conclude, trying to recover the stories of freedom, uh, freedom seekers is hard. It's hard for a reason. Being involved in the Underground Railroad took courage and skill. It was a secret organization for a reason. And that means finding out details about its existence over 200 years later is challenging. It's hard history to do, but needs to be done and then shared. Doing history should not be restricted to lone scholars plowing away in archives. Historians have a responsibility to share their work with the communities they write about in meaningful ways. Rather than brushing this history under the table, as had uh, been the case for so long, groups such as Fall River Preservation Society are paving the way to, hitting, uh, to bringing these hidden histories to light. So, thank you. We're gonna take some uh, questions, anything anyone wants to say in just a minute, but in case anyone wants to stand up or take a break, it might be a good moment. Uh, uh, on that segue, I'll say, uh, in case I don't get a chance afterwards, can't thank Roger Williams enough, not just uh, Dr. Carrington Farmer, uh, Kristen and TJ, but also uh, the other crew in the back who set up the food and the drinks back there and setting up electronics to make the whole event happen. Uh, thank you all very, very much. And I'll just quickly say thank you so much um, to the Fall River, Fall River Preservation Society for partnering with us on this. Um, this is really invaluable research and experience for our undergraduate students, you know, to be able to do, to get into the archives, to do this public history work. Um, it's a real coup for them to do that. So thank you for listening to us tonight and thank you so much to Jim and Alex for, you know, partnering with us.